You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. Welcome to episode 145 of the Life in Ruins podcast, where we investigate the careers and research of those living a life in ruins. I am your host, Carlton Gover, and I am joined by my co hosts, Connor John and David Howe. For this week's episode, we're not joined by anybody, just the three of us. We have a good outline. I think it's going to be a fun time. What are we talking about tonight, tonight, fellas? Mm-hmm. Connor, what are, we, what are we doing? Vikings, my lord. Vikings, my lord. Vikings, my lord. May so, I ask why we changed it from those living life in ruins, and now we changed it to a life in ruins and research? Keywords to try to get our goddamn podcast on top 10 lists in archaeology and science, because for some reason, we were not hitting the keywords that were needed to get popped up, because pseudo, yeah. pseudo-archaeology by Kinkilla is, is beating us on the charts for whatever reason low so, hanging fruit bro low hanging fruit and we've also we don't just do the careers anymore we do start going into research so i figured we'd we'd hit that we'd, we don't like the careers there. huh yeah. careers are dumb people yeah. are like i just want to hear about sites and i'm like look <laughs> look it up yourself <laughs> <laughs> you got the internet come on yes it is read changed. hancock and just get it over with <laughs> read hancock get it over we're, oh, we're no, uh, no 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 we're alienating all our audience here so yeah Thank you for those who like the the career ones. We yeah, we'll still too. do them. But yeah, yeah, we do want to talk about research. But I, so, I won't show up. Yeah. The, imp- the yeah, impetus don't. for this whole thing was I've been cleaning out my Facebook feed, doing some curation of what I'm shown on Facebook. And I, I'm a part of all those archaeology groups. And I've, I've been leaving them because it's they've just got so much pseudo arc. And I saw one post recently that was about Vikings in Oklahoma. And I was like, you know what we just did? We've done a couple episodes recently on settling of the Americas. And we haven't really talked Vikings. It was mentioned in Settlers of Saruti, in which we use it as like an outlier in the European settlement of the Americas. I was like, you know what? We haven't talked Vikings. The season two of one of those Viking shows just wrapped up recently. It's like the sequel to Vikings about Ragnar Lothbrok. You guys don't want to talk about Vikings Valhalla or something. Yeah, season two of Valhalla just wrapped up, and a really good show. I was like, let's talk about Vikings. We have uh, something that we can all contribute to. I do love that we also start with Vikings, and then we're going to bring it back to the Americas because we're selfish little bitches. We have to do everything <laughs> about America. <laughs> we have to be like, we need to, we need to clean the slate real quick. <laughs> yeah. And also, like, uh, our audience is probably going to be interested in this. So we want to – this is what we're going to do. So we're going to we're gonna outline what we're going to talk gonna about. What we're going to do is I'm going to pull up my 23 and me and actually show the world how much Viking I actually have because everyone's like, I have Viking DNA. First off, do you have Cooper DNA? Do you have Shoemaker DNA? Oh, do you have Wagon Rider DNA? No, you don't. You have Scandinavian DNA, you plebe. Do plebe. <laughs> Did not expect it how to much, go this way. <laughs> how much parvo DNA do people have? Uh, <laughs> Ayo. I have Parvo. parvo. <laughs> you, don't have, you don't have Parvo. You had it apparently. Par par, par for par for the coast. Coast? Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, what what are you you? So so real quick, right? Oh God, just, I, uh, as is tradition, I forgot my freaking password. Uh, a summary of the Vikings. So Vikings, right? Everyone, there's a romanization of Vikings in popular culture. Everyone thinks they're warriors, but Vikings are really seafarers and traders. Like baseline, that's what they do. You'll find them originally starting out in Scandinavia. So this is really including like Denmark, Norway, Sweden, and Finland. And uh, we're talking about like the late eighth century to late eleventh century common era or ad so 700s to 1000s did i do that right yes it just so happens to be around the middle of the warming period which causes a lot of uh let's see anxiety to be to be (laughs) safe around the world it causes mongols it causes the iroquois to start bashing each other's brains in it causes the crusades causes a lot of problems yes 100%. One hundred percent. Well, it, crusades come later. Yes, but here's the deal: the medieval warm period that caused all of the like have to crops and shit to fail all over the world made Europe like be like, well, "We don't have nothing," and ever all the Muslims in the Middle East had everything, and they were like, "Oh, you know what? 
Deus vult, my lord. And they went and just killed all yes. of them. Okay, so the medieval warming period for everyone, it's from 800 <laughs> to 1200. So the Viking period happens like just as the start of it, but ends half midway. It's almost um, like the people that were farming in Scandinavia had nothing, you know, they were famining and crop failing, so they had to go steal shit from other people. Yeah, and then Carlton yes, and I and were talking the, about this yeah. too, is like, um, so in, in the context, like England's kind of like, fallen apart europe in general is kind of falling apart during this period and not not doing super good right so the roman empire in the west out of rome has fallen by the fifth century uh sixth century ad and then it's it moves to buys it to byzantium constantinople in the byzantine empire eastern whole the roman empire so like some of those old roman holdouts in england france they're going by the wayside. England is a mix of different kingdoms. Like it's not, it's like reconfiguring itself as Vikings or these, these Norse folks begin to start doing their raids and, and it's not doing it out of bloodlust, which is how it's often romanticized. Like these mm-hmm. people want farmland. Like that's, that's kind of the impetus. Like Scandinavia, not a great place to be a farmer. Like having farmland is a status symbol. Uh, and so that's what they're coveting. And England is rich in farmland and they start raiding England doesn't unify and they kind of start using Vikings to their advantage. So it's not like these North and there's different Norse factions. So it, it, there's factions within the Vikings, there's factions within England and France, and they're all vying for power in one way or another. So it's not a homogenous Vikings versus English. It's there's, there's a lot more geopolitics that are at play here in which they're using each other really to set up uh, Vikings for farmland. And that's Dane. And then, yeah, Northumbria, Mercia, East Anglia, Essex, Wessex, Sussex, Kent, uh, Wales, and Strathclyde. Strathide is that the, the word? They were they were the kingdoms that existed after the fall of Rome in Britain. Of like it was basically warring states, and they would fight each other. But while that was happening, the Normans who war Norse themselves from France were invading with William the Conqueror. But at the same time, the Vikings and Scandinavian uh, people were migrating from quote migrating from scandinavia to the northern parts of england so the first um, viking yeah. raids are 793 and nor and, and the normans come over at the end of the viking age in 1066 and wrap it all up so it's mm-hmm. vikings from scandinavia they're also in france which is a whole different thing and then to kind of settle this up yeah william the conqueror comes in he's norman viking and he set he settles everything in england and that's the end of the viking age in 1066 and that's when we start getting to the mid and late medieval period and then that sets the stage for a unified england and Arthur. The, oh Alfred, 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 stefan's yeah. gonna get mad at us because we always fuck up england united kingdom so i think it's just it's england at this point england ireland and scotland like the whole british isles is british is what he said but english is different than british like english is people who live in england uh, yeah, he so said they, Ir- Irish people might debate that they're not part of Britain, but the British Isles, but it's technically an island off of Britain, you know, like that. Yeah, I think there's and a the United Kingdom. Kingdom uh, yeah, it's not, doesn't include Northern Ireland. Is that correct? Because they're Ireland the, proper. Yeah, Ar- Ireland proper. Okay, yeah. So you, yeah, you, North you, Ireland is definitely part of Britain. Yeah. Of the United Kingdom. Britain is different. Yeah, so. So the Vikings aren't this like militaristic, holy shit, badass that show up. It's just a very interesting geopolitical world in in northern and western Europe. Exactly. And they come in with some tactics like the shield wall that that really is able to capitalize on military tactics post Roman Empire in in England. But you anytime like horses and cavalry really get involved in these battles, it go south for the Vikings pretty quick, but they are also like larger people. Generally, we have that from the archaeological record as well as historic documents. We're talking about a group of people that are heavily invested in eating protein, cheese, milk, cattle. And they're, they're like six foot tall people that show up to these like medieval, early medieval peasants in England who are like five, five, maybe. So a bunch of short kings below. There is some bioanthropology at play here in terms of diet that is affecting the ability of, of, of the warrior class. But it's are you are we saying that human variation exists between different groups of people? No. Nope. Wow. 
I was gonna make yeah. a cranial morphology joke. <laughs> yeah, this is where I was, I was hoping <laughs> you guys would you couldn't you can hit that. the nail on the head. So if you measure the heads, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> so what if you're looking at heads. <laughs> right. So it, it's like it, uh, the that was a horrible stutter, and I apologize for those listening. It's, okay. it's a lot. As as a theme of this podcast, it's way more complicated than than it it seems, and also at the same time, like these people, they're trying to they're farmers and they're traders, they're trying to access more farmland. We also have Viking the the Rurik dynasty took control over territories in the east, specifically with the Slavs and the Finns in Eastern Europe. They annexed Kiev in eight eight eighty two, and that's where the Kievan Rus come up. So they are like Vikings. Um, but they're called the Kiev and Rus, and they start using their trading really with the Byzantine Empire. So they're they're really trying to they're the first people to really connect directly northern Europe in Scandinavia with the rest of the Mediterranean world to really create the European sphere of, of control that we know of today. Like this is where it kind of starts. This is where Scandinavia has entered the chat in terms of being in the political world of the greater European continent. The first surviving account of a Viking funeral comes from an Arab trader actually who was in Kiev or like in the Slavic lands up there and was trading for furs and he was trading like silver and gold and stuff with the the, the Rus that were up there. And like, they were like, Hey, like their chief had just died and he's writing about it. And he's like, these people are like filthy. They spit into the same like barrel of water that they wash. Like they all pass it down and wash. And he's like, they have, they said they're promiscuous and had no dignity or like whatsoever, uh, uh, according to an an Arab wealthy man at the time. So like, they're probably just people living in the woods, (laughs) but like, uh, they, they sacrificed one of the slaves to be with the king and stuff like that and like burn the long ship and stuff. And like, that's all from an Arabic account, which to your point, Carlton, it's like they've entered the chat. Like you don't think about Vikings and Arabs ever interacting. <laughs> right. <laughs> cool. Yeah. And you have evidence down even in like to, to Baghdad of Vikings making it down there, at least in terms of trade goods and things like that. I think something we're kind of skipping over a little bit is just the use of waterways and boats is like the most important thing. They're not like Carlton had mentioned, they're not cavalry. They're not invading large chunks of land. What they're doing is using the waterways and ports to create these trading networks, maybe annexing small areas of uh, Scandinavia, uh, Europe, uh, Britain, et cetera, but they're, they're not really traveling inland because their strength and their economy is really built on boats, trading and stuff like that. Maritime. Unless it's, yeah, yeah, they can get in because the, the Viking vessels, the long ship is amazing work of engineering because it has a, it has a, a shallow draft in the water. So it only sinks like a couple feet. It has a very like broad hull at the bottom. And it's able, it's an ocean going vessel and it can go riverways. So like unlike other boats at the time, you either had your freshwater vessels or your ocean going vessels. You didn't have one and all. And that's what the Viking longship was. So they were able to sail out of the fjords in Scandinavia, up the river Thames, down whatever river, the, the Seine, whatever's in France. Sign. Yeah. So they, they can penetrate deep without changing. And these are small, sleek, gort, like very pretty looking vessels that can get into deep uh, arteries pretty quick without you noticing them. They can make it to like the Caspian and Black Sea down the Danube. Like that's, that's super impressive and not something you normally see. They're light enough to like, they can ocean fare, but they can also be carried on like logs and stuff like pretty easily, which I think was the, but yes, going up channels and stuff was like what made them super effective and efficient. Yeah, going um, up rivers. It's and they're single mass ships. Like they're pretty easy to relative to some of those other ocean going vessels. You can make a lot of these, and that's what these Viking traders did. And they come in different forms, and they're just really cool feats of engineering that were really that was the techno the technology that really allowed the Vikings to capitalize on being in, connected into this this globalized trade system. Yeah, I mean everyone's seen them, and they're also um, they're symmetrical both in the. Uh, in the aft, in the st- what's the front of a ship? That's not the keel. That's the bottom. The prow. The prow. So they could like turn around the, super quick. You could just stop what you're doing, like turn 180 degrees, and and row the other way, and it's still <laughs> as effective as you know. They're really cool ships that allowed them, as, as we've said, and what we'll allude to later to get to Denmark. Sorry, bow, bow, Iceland, prow is bow. the very front of it. Yeah, they're able to 
follow uh, to get to Iceland, Greenland, and then very briefly Newfoundland in Eastern Canada. So could you, really could you say that, that the Vikings used their boats similar to how Genghis Khan used horses? And I think that so. They, that's like, they just used it in a way that was never seen before. Yeah. Like a technology that was spread very fat, like effective in areas that it wasn't like endemic to. Yeah. Yeah. Like in like uh, and run horses tactics all over, but. and kind of like that. And so were boats. Boats were everywhere. Horses were everywhere. But this is like a new use of it that is so unique that allows them to kind of thrive and expand over large periods or large. Yeah, it's like, the, it's like the aircraft the carrier. carrier. You know, it's kind of that same thing. Like it was a radical transition in naval warfare, like the put a bunch of fucking planes on a ship. And now you don't have these major ship to ship battles with battleships anymore. Now it's like fleets. Mushroom out origins. Yeah. Now you're just throwing aircraft at each other, like a bunch of darts to a dartboard and sinking them from a distance. And that's how like battleships end. And so like very similar, the introduction of the Viking ship was a radical change in seafaring that allowed Vikings with one ship to, to trade in fresh and salt water across the Mediterranean and North Atlantic. Absolutely fascinating. And on that note, we'll be right back. We're going to dive into uh, Viking settlements, Iceland, Greenland, and then Can- and, and then Canada. <laughs> what is that? Are, are, yeah. yeah, are yeah. we going to dive I don't, into I don't know. I've, been <laughs> I've been watching so much Chris <laughs> Stefano, and then listening to David. What can you do? When, when David gives the terms to the people on Sea of Thieves, it's just like... It's I just, got it. Pretend I'm on a long boat. We're playing Sea of Thieves. What you can do is interact, sink people or you can interact with them. And I get on the fucking prow of the ship and I go, all right, here's how this is going to go. You got two options. The second one, really going to suck for you. The first one, lay down your arms, climb to the top of the sailboat, your crow's nest, raise the alliance flag. You have 10 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> and this one all New Zealand kid was like, ah, oh, ah, oh, the first one. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> I forget how many right. children play that game, but we just get on there and bully teenagers the entire time. Like, listen. All right, anyways, we'll be right back with episode 145 of Life for Ruins podcast. Welcome back to episode 145 of Life for Ruins podcast. We're talking Vikings. We're giggling. We're having a good old time. We did want to continue our conversation um, and talk about a little bit about the occupation of Iceland and Greenland by the Vikings, except for Carlton's keeling over in laughter. Yeah, my bad. No, you're good. You're good. They definitely made it to Greenland and Iceland, spent some time over there. Yes. So... After getting to England and France, they kept going. They kept going west. Uh, there's a couple of, of, of reasons for that. One of which is still that desire to find more farmland, as alliances and boundaries are being drawn up in England. There are still groups of Scandinavians who are still seeking farmland and <clears throat> trying to find land that's that hasn't been quote unquote claimed yet. So we have early for those that know their geographies. Iceland is a small island in between small-ish island in between the British Isles and Greenland. And also, uh, one of the only places on Earth not colonized by indigenous peoples first. When the Europeans got there, they were the first to get there. Making them indigenous. Oh! Oh, oh careful with that Juxposition. one. Yeah, okay. <laughs> they get to Iceland it been between like 870 to 930 CE. So this is after they're, you know, raiding England. In, seven, in 793 when the first Viking raids show up. So about like 100 years later, they're pretty well situated between 930 and 1200. And they kind of continue on as like the holdouts of non-Christian day of, of Scandinavians from about 1200 to 1262, right? So like, and there's uh, occupation a little bit um, after that. And uh, basically in 1262, they become part of, the Norwegian rule. So that's when that ends. So basically they come, come under like the, the country of Norway, the kingdom of Norway, they become under Norwegian rule in 1262. So they get there a hundred years after they start raiding England, but then Greenland's a little bit different. So green, so basically another hundred years later in the late huh. 1980s, CE, that's when we start seeing Vikings in Greenland and they last there until like the 15th century. 
Wow. Not a great place to be a farmer. And this is where we, in both Iceland and Greenland, they especially Greenland, not very green, they struggle pretty hard in their farming practices. They try to go back to like ancestral farming practices in, in Scandinavia because they're really trying to make it work. It's not as great there. And they are interacting with Inuit in Greenland. Scraylings. Um, yes. Yeah. So you, 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 we do have good evidence for that. And, you know, presumably, eventually, they they look a little bit more west. And there are anecdotal things talking about either maps or oral histories about people think reference North America. Yeah. Specifically, the um, there's a guy, the, the Vinland map and the Vinland sagas. So there's and kind Vinland of... Is- Vaguely made out to be Newfoundland. And then Lansaw Meadows is there, which is confirmed to be a Norwegian or Norse settlement. But uh, it's not quite sure if that's the one that Lee for Torvald Eriksson was at. And the, and the dating doesn't really line up with what they talk about in their kind of... In the sagas. In the sagas, yeah. That's the beginning evidence of of Vikings in North America isn't solid to be to start out with. So you, and there's also another guy, even Norton Horsford, who's a chemist and part-time Scrooge impersonator who believed that there's a legendary settlement called Norum Bega that appears on kind of 16th century maps. And he thinks he found that in North America, huh. made a plaque for it, made a building, really went ham on it, even though there's not really a ton of evidence, but he spent the money and thought it was. So, Those are kind of the anecdotal evidence of Vikings getting to North America. Yeah. And just for reference, like the first legit map that we know of that, that has cartography of, of Vinland 1503 by a Genoese map maker. It's called the Canero map. Mm -hmm. Um, It mentions a site of Vinland in the first time in history. So that's, that's confirmed. So 1503, we do have it. And that's only like what? Nine years after Columbus gets to Hispaniola? Eleven years. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that was pretty quick once once Europeans really found, came in contact with, with North America. But yeah, there is definitely a confirmed Viking site in Newfoundland. It has a very short occupation. I'm trying to find the date for it real quick. But it's, it's – they have burials there, and some of those remains are f- – fucking filled with stone projectile points huh. so uh yeah so i think i think the latest with the locals i think the latest dates or the 2021 article that is uh we'll put in the show notes says that the the beginning date of norse activity is 1021 ad i'm assuming and and you know they really only think it and articles say they only lived there for at least like 20 years. There's and this really like, yeah, sh- is they working. Yeah. And we're out. <laughs> I think they found coins there. Yeah. It was very quick. It's at the end of the Viking age. And also you have to contextualize like how those ships, the Viking long ships are great, but the journey from, you know, Scandinavia, you have to go to England. Then you have to stop off in Iceland. Then you have to stop off in Greenland. Like it's just not, they don't have the ships meant for that long distance continuous trade, especially in the North Atlantic, which is not fucking fun to sail many times of the year. No, like the storage is on those things. Isn't like on those large, like uh, boats you have Columbus on or large galleons, you have the ability to store tons of supplies. So you can make those long journeys and, and survive well when you get to the location that you actually get to. Yeah, You got to so, drop some of the axes to fit some more water on that ship. So it's probably yeah. all those projectile points in them. Little little margin for error with the Viking ships, and it's just and they're, it seems like predominantly they're they're using Newfoundland for timber, which they already have access. Once they're like brought into the larger European sphere of influence, like they have access to timber, so like it becomes they don't need it anymore. Once they're brought in as a European player. They have access to timber. They have access to farmland. Like they don't need people in Newfoundland anymore, fundamentally. Yeah. And people are, have been situated now in Greenland and Iceland for like 100, 200 years at this point. They're, they're good. Like there's no reason to keep 
going. And especially what it seems like the contact with um, indigenous First Nations in Canada wasn't very positive. So, yeah. <laughs> Anecdotally, I don't know if this is true. I've never read it, but I've heard this in multiple like history things. Is that the Vikings brought <laughs> brought um like traded in some of the areas uh, milk for like other like goods that the the natives had, and like the natives got super fucking sick because they have no enzyme to digest lactose, and they were like thought they were poisoned by them, so they attacked. Rightfully so. Last time I got dairy poisoned, I wanted to shoot someone myself too. Um, I've never heard that before. Uh, that yeah, sounds, that, sounds, like a, that that's, sounds like that's, a Thanksgiving story to me. I <laughs> saw it in like a like a documentary on History Channel, and usually they're not too off, but like that might not be true. Let me look it up. Yes, the home of ancient aliens. You know what? <laughs> you might be right. Yeah, it sounds like, sounds like they all like you know yeah. hung out together history, and sang. History to, Channel um, pre 2010 had some good stuff, but in terms of like who were the first. Europeans that we know interacted in, in North America. It is definitely the Scandinavians with this settlement. The Greenland counts as North America. They've known about it, whatever. Once again, we kind of hit on this several times in the podcast. Like Some of the last people to figure out that the Western Hemisphere existed were Central Europeans or Western Europeans. However, that hasn't stopped settlers in the Americas from reinventing how long in particular Vikings have been in, in the Americas. So we kind of want to talk about this because we talked a little bit about Salutrian. This isn't Salutrian, but in terms of like a pseudo archeology span and pseudoscience and, and taking these ideas of like, what's all, already a very fascinating, cool piece of human history of Scandinavians interacting with in, in North America. Now they're taking it a step too far. Yeah, this this is what pisses me off. Is like we have Vikings in North America. Like for fuck's sake, can we just keep that? Can we just enjoy it? Can we rally behind it? Love it? But instead, we always have to or people are always going to take that back and up, apply it for their own nefarious goals and or rewriting history. So just just enjoy the Vikings for fuck's sake. Uh, I see several uh, websites that point to it, one of them being citing a podcast, so we can't say that that's not true. Um, you know, the one named everythingeverywhere.com, and let's see, there's there's several when I pull up a Google search, so it may just be a rumor, but like... And for those people that are confused about what David is talking about, he's talking about the the thing that we talked about like 10 minutes ago. Yeah, sorry, I was looking it up. <laughs> but yeah, and it does say here on the Vinland Wikipedia page, they traded milk, so... Anyway, confirm. I don't know if that that one little story is true. We can't say that they didn't get lactose intolerant poisoning. Okay, that's been established. Thank you for. Do you think they got gluten intolerant poisoning? (laughs) Jesus Christ, gluten. I think it's just if you're lactose intolerant, that assumes the poisoning. Same way. (laughs) Intolerance (laughs) equals poisoning. (laughs) How they they spent twelve white men came and they gave me gays. (laughs) (laughs) Jesus. Okay, but and so there, there are things that pop up uh, that are specific to this the pseudoscience behind pushing back or reinventing where and when Vikings uh, interacted in in North America in particular. It's becoming more prominent in American discourse because for some reason white supremacy is really globbed on to Vikings and the romanticization and mythos of Vikings as this warrior race. And so like it's becoming more prevalent today, this idea. So it, it's strongly linked to identity. But so as, as Connor mentioned, there's this Vinland map. And can you, what what is the Vinland map, Connor? So, actually, I actually don't have that off the top of my head. David, you know this, right? The Vinland map? Uh, it appears to be a map of a land of vines. Thank you, David. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what the answer is. Uh, Vinland map. No, you're good. No. Like we had mentioned oh, before. Look at this map. Like we had mentioned before, Vinland map is associated with the saga of Eric the Red, Leif Erikson, etc. And it's suggesting and describing locations that could be in North America. Um, right, specifically. So 15th century map. And it yeah, allegedly shows locations, as Connor said, Newfoundland. Yeah. So it's, I feel like we went backwards there. 
It's a forgery. We, we figure that out. So yeah, there's this whole, there's the Vinland map. It's supposed to show <laughs> Viking settlements. It's in, it's from the you know 1400s. Turns out it's a 20th century forgery. So no. yeah, it, it, it first popped up in 1957 when Yale University acquired it. It was supposed to be this genuine pre-Columbian map. It also shows Africa, Asia, and Europe on a landmass south of Greenland that's labeled Vinland. And it gets tied in because at this point, people have, a, have an idea that Europeans had visited that area in the 11th century. But in 2018, it was recently, you know, like recently confirmed forgery. The Vinland map is bullshit. Um, um, luckily, uh, there is another thing um, that has been proven a forgery uh, the Kensington. Tin rune stone. Uh, yeah, classic. Yes. I first learned about this on the History Channel. I forget what uh, the, what it was about, but it wasn't Curse of Oak Island, but they did a whole thing. I think it was just Vikings in America. Mm-hmm. But Didn't he put the runes like as English words? Wasn't that like how they debunked it? No, so it was modern. It was like, so they brought in a bunch of lexicographers, con- conifers? Lexiconeries. Whatever they do. Lexiconery. And the, the Norse runes were much later runes than what the age was claimed. So basically there's a farmer in Minnesota or is it Wisconsin? One of those. Uh, Minnesota Vikings would make sense. I th- yeah, maybe. I think it's Minnesota. A farmer finds it basically like upturns uh, a stump and in the stump itself is runestone. And using archaeological analysis, one – we know that it wasn't in the ground very long because you don't have um, the roots aren't leaving the residue that they would have if the stone had been in there for like hundreds of years. Like all the soil, the soil markers, everything doesn't work towards that. And then second, when they, they took a gander at it, it's like, wait, those runes are not from the 11th century or before. Like those are very much runes that modern people knew of at that time. And I think 1898 is when it was discovered. Yes. 1898. And turns out the Kensington runestone, the guy that found it is fucking Scandinavian. And so like Minnesota and Wisconsin, those are parts of the United States that were heavily occupied colonially by Scandinavians. And you, if, if you look very closely, like the dude that found it, like actually knew runes, like it was kind you know, he, he invented this. The guy that found it is the one that placed it. It is an absolute hoax. If it quacks like a Norwegian. If it drinks milk like a Norwegian. Yeah. But they they discovered this and disproved this pretty quickly. It was like 12 years later. We're not, we're not winning to 2018 this time, which is, which is good, but it hasn't been fully not accepted by groups in Minnesota Wisconsin, et cetera. There's a, there's still, there's a museum today that kind of oh glorifies God, you, it. You can go to the website. It's, it's fucking crazy. Cause the website, it's the runestone museum and they don't mention it's a hoax at all. It's a very, mm-hmm. it's a, it's a bad, bad website. It just says we have the Kensington runestone in our museum. The runestone and the enduring mystery of its origin continues to be the hallmark of the runestone museum. It's like, no, it was debunked in 1910. Like, we all know it's bullshit. <laughs> it looks like, just like the Rosetta Stone. The guy was just trying to make a fun. It- I mean, this is the dude's name. The discovery of the Kensington runestone changed the life of Olaf Olman and his descendants forever. Like, the dude is Scandinavian as fuck. And he found the. Yeah, no. It is absolute bullshit. And it is in Minnesota. And many places in Minnesota. And the businesses there do have rune stones or Vikings as identifying symbols. Like there's the Minnesota Vikings. That is an area that was colonized by Scandinavians. I mean, that that's the link. Like these people are bringing their culture with them and trying to like set, as we've talked about on this podcast and archaeology a lot, trying to claim ancestry to a place. And that was the way these people were doing it. It's like, oh, look at these Viking rune stones. They're, they're capitalizing on the fact that people at this time after the Chicago World's Fair where it was becoming more well-known that Vikings had got here before Christopher Columbus, pissed off the Italian-Americans, but the Scandinavian-Americans loved it, and they were kind of seeding the ground, very much like the English did with Piltdown Man. Piltdown Man. Right? You know, with the hoax of the first upright, big-brained hominid in, in England. They're, these people are doing the same, to set themselves as descendants of this land. They're like, oh, well, we don't feel bad about killing all the natives. Like, there were already Vikings here in Minnesota 800 years ago. According to my 23andMe, I am 48.7% Northwestern European, and I'm going to use that blood right to say that I don't like that the mascot for Minnesota is Vikings. I want it changed. 
Is it Northwest months. Europe, the English Isles? I'm looking at all of this, and it says it could be Norwegia, Nor- Norwegia, uh, <laughs> Norway, Sweden, <laughs> Finland, uh, Germany, France, Netherlands, Belgium, Austria, Andorra, United Kingdom, or Ireland. So, so just anyway. Europe. So it's just how Europe. is is how is Norse? It's like Hauger. But yeah, either way, I take offense, uh, and I want it changed, and I will tweet that right now. On that note, we will catch you in the next segment where we... Change it to the Minnesota Runestones. Thank you, David. We'll be right back. Welcome back to episode 145. We're in the third segment here with me and Carlton and Connor talking about Vikings and Norwegians and uh, people who commit Viking acts of Norwegian descent is what I should say. Yes. And so the Vikings in Minnesota. It's like keto. And- it's a lifestyle. <laughs> Vikings in Minnesota are like a well-known hoax and like ongoing bullshit issue within popular culture. But more recently, now we got Vikings in Oklahoma. <laughs> That's So that post I was talking about in segment one, it was talking about like Viking runestones in Oklahoma. And this has spurred this idea that is even like far more fucking far-fetched. So like how did Vikings get to Minnesota? Well, they got to Newfoundland, followed, not the James River, the Hudson River. No, what am I talking? I need to look at a fucking map. Hudson goes down New York. Map that makes sense. Canada. St. Lawrence. The St. Lawrence River into the Great mm. Lakes. And they could like access the Great Lakes. That's how they got to Minnesota. This theory of how they got to Oklahoma is now they sailed all across the East Coast mm. around the Florida Panhandle. And like up the Mississippi River, like now we're adding it. Uh, like Minnesota is pushing it. Like it's bullshit, but it's like okay. But see, that means though, if they're going through the Caribbean, they're gonna come into classical Mayas at that point and be trading with them. So let's look for some obsidian back in Norway. Yeah, it, there'll be it, these volcanoes it, there already. But <laughs> additionally, like in the Viking sagas. They talk about getting to Newfoundland. Like it's mentioned. And that's really like, well, maybe this is legit. They don't ever mention Minnesota. They don't ever mention fucking Oklahoma. They don't mention like the Vikings themselves don't talk about it. More importantly, indigenous people of the Americas don't fucking talk about it. You do find groups that do talk about Newfoundland. They're like, yes. But like, so the two groups that we're talking about that would have been there, fucking nothing. They're not saying a goddamn word about it. And this is a case of very similar to what's happening, what happened in Minnesota. The people that are per- perpetuating these runestone myths or Vikings in Oklahoma are of Scandinavian descent. So it is the same cookie cutter bullshit argument. They're Scandinavians in Oklahoma. And this is being way more wrapped up at this point with white nationalism, specifically in Oklahoma. So there's like a couple places and, and it's, and they're debunked in a very similar manner to the Kensington runestone. The geomorphology doesn't fit. The taphonomy of the artifacts don't fit. And the runestones themselves are not runestones from that age. They're much more modern, much more like kingdom of Norway kind of runestones. Runestones aren't homogenous. Yep. Homogenous. Homogenous. Right. Like other languages, like other alphabets, runestones change. And so these are easily discredited discoveries. So but I'm uh, sorry for our listeners. There are no Vikings in Minnesota. The Vikings never sailed the Mississippi River in, into Oklahoma either. Yeah. Well, the crazy thing is that there's Wikipedia pages with this now. So we have – it's gotten big enough to where they're wanting to – write about this in wikipedia and they are correctly citing it and saying it's incorrect these are all been proven false there's been master's thesis on one of the rune stones so guy was like i'm gonna tackle this in my master's thesis and and disproved it so it they are growing and i wouldn't be surprised if this grows into other if it's alabama or if it's mississippi or if it's somewhere else like that that shit didn't oh, use oh, why, that ship has sailed to Hawaii, that there is a Hawaiian Viking ship hoax. And this was perpetuated April 1st, 1936 by the Honolulu Star Bulletin, which published a story about a Viking ship discovered in Hawaii, which was accompanied by a photo of the rare find. However, 
no such thing was ever discovered there. So that's because the- there was a conversation at a bar where one guy said, I hate you, how lays being here on our island. And the guy was like, well, you know what? We were here first, bro. <laughs> and that's what that started as. Yes. Guarantee it. <laughs> and, these, these and then he died in Pearl Harbor. What? Possibly. This was 1936. So may have been a sailor at a bar. Yep. I'm going to um, hell. That's cool, guys. Put <laughs> 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 for lying. Connor has exited the chat. <laughs> he's, he's dead. We've lost. He's, he's crying. <laughs> guys, um, the rule of comedy, if it's if it's 10 years later, it's fine to laugh about. So, but like, even if, but what, what's crazy about this is like, we're, we're like a lot of this stuff, because there's not much academic literature on it. There's academic literature, particularly on the Newfoundland stuff, because that is archaeological context that has been studied. But if you just like Google hoaxes, a bunch comes up. But like if you look at the comment section of these web pages, people are losing their fucking minds. Like, no, this is true. This isn't a hoax. And then like the History Channel perpetuates it because there's also this like Curse of Oak Island show. I don't know if anyone's watched it. I can't get into it. Like I usually love dumb shit like that. I can't <laughs> is that about Vikings? I thought it was about just like it's a kind well, of like uh, they're recently one of their more recent episodes. They think they found a Viking artifact. Um, yeah. Yes. Where is Oak Island, Virginia? Um, no, that's Roanoke. Roanoke, right? Okay, so I but thought it was a show about Roanoke. Colony of Roanoke is in the Carolinas, but there is a Roanoke, Virginia. So Oak Island is in Nova Scotia in Canada. So we're getting closer. That's not too far fetched, then. I mean, like, is that Newfoundland's right above Nova Scotia? Yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd buy it, but anything that deals with the History Channel on that show, it's like... Let's ask the Vice Principal's Canadian Dusty Trombone. <laughs> Wait, what? Well, in your mouth? Let's check out Kyle Dunn again. His Joe he, Biden impression is... is the, the Vice Principal's Canadian Dusty oh, Trombone guy. has been yeah. killed by tricks. My fellow Jamaicans. <laughs> so the thing with the, the, the is that even if they did find something like good right now, like they've put themselves in that corner where there's pseudoscience. So like, yeah, it's not easy to get out of it. Like, right. Like I've, I've labeled them as such. Maybe it's just me being a dick, but like you, you kind of made you kind of made your bed. So now you shit in it or something, whatever this thing is. I, no, well, you 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 coined that term. <laughs> now you made your bed. Now you have to shit in it too. Like that was a Connor. That's a Connor quote. No one says that. You don't shit where you sleep. <laughs> yeah, you don't shit where you sleep. That's, yeah, you don't. Well, it's, you don't shit where you eat. That that's that's the. Just because the green man can't see it doesn't mean you don't fear you, man. <laughs> You shit in a toilet or in the woods, okay? I'm so mad that we that <laughs> that, vi- that reel got pulled of our uh, inspire if uh, turning life and ruins quotes into inspirational. <laughs> Why did it get pulled? Order? Because it had um, Carly Ray Jes- Carly Ray Jespin's song, and that got flagged as copyright infringement. Yeah. Yeah. Should probably post a meme or two here and there. <laughs> we yeah. were doing it for a bit. I was. You were. You were. You <laughs> both were. <laughs> There are some gems out of that, but yeah, we, need we just to need to take the old memes and turn them into reels, and then make money off of it. That's true. Yeah. Also, archaeology life uh, is now a fifteen thousand person followed page that just takes our memes, <laughs> or they take other archaeology memes. Yeah, no, um, fuck those people. I've been I've been <laughs> ranting about those guys for a while because I went on to try it. Like I messaged him, like, dude, at least fucking credit us. Yeah, this is um, the official stance of the Life and Room podcast. Fuck, Fuck you. In particular. He's an archaeology student, too. Yeah. Like he's out there. If uh, if you're at SAAs, bro. Quit stealing our shit. Yeah, quit fucking stealing our shit. Like, Jesus. Oh, speaking of, uh, I, I will not be going to SAAs this year due to my feeble state. And so we, I will not be there as as promised. Carlton, you will be there, though, right? I have to be there. Okay. I, I fly in Tuesday, and I take a red eye Friday because I have to run a powwow Saturday. Yeah, you're I won't be there either. Me. God damn it. <laughs> You can say, <laughs> you can accurately describe a powwow as a powwow. Yeah, I'm actually running a powwow. Like that's, you just, that's, you that's, just can't <laughs> refer to like a meeting at work as a powwow, right? Is that the new thing? I think so. Yeah, that's. Yeah, yeah that's. I mean, just, I follow yeah. a few indigenous creators, and they're like, "You can't say this. You can't say that. You can't say that." And then the next day, it's like, like reversing that. So I just, I literally just can't keep up. But I, I want to respect it. What's yeah. the okay, stance so, on Eskimo? Um, no, I, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do this properly. We're gonna do this properly. Shut the fuck up! Shut the fuck up! We're doing this properly. What do natives think about this sort of 
perpetuation of uh, Vikings and things like that because we have this on the script. It. Oh yes, it yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so actually, I talked with me. I, I talked with this with Matt um, Reed. Maybe like a year ago. So Matt Reed, Pawnee Nation, tip of you know, because we're out of Oklahoma now. It's it's becoming problematic where it rears its ugly head a lot, especially in land cl- land claims in Oklahoma, where there are people that are like, well, Vikings were here first, and you know, it goes back to that whole myth of well, we were already here, so it's not native land. So no, to my knowledge, I have never once heard an indigenous oral tradition which mentions Vikings in Oklahoma. Or in the continental U.S., and they mention a lot of things. They, they a pretty lot much of describe things. describe everything. But Pathfinder was a hell of a movie. It was Carl Urban, man, <laughs> hell of a big deal. Oh, uh, man. C- question for the us and the audience, just to ponder: with the Vikings or the Norwegians getting to, or the Norse, I should say, getting to North America and Greenland at the time they did, would that not have spread diseases? Uh, that could have then spread as well, contributing to the decline of native populations before Columbus? I think the interactions were different. I think that's why, primarily. Like, one, new f- those northeastern Canada... More isolated. Not as, more isolated, not as densely populated, based on the evidence of, of violence and, like, the small and well, habitation... Well, like, Norwegian blood on your face after hitting them with, a like, a celt axe... You're gonna get some diseases from that. <laughs> yeah, like that, I, that is that is bloodborne pathogens. But I, I, yeah. to your point, I don't know if they actually spread any. Just yeah, I, they're not. I, I my knowledge of indigenous geography in Canada is, especially northeastern Canada, is like really bad. But we do know there was much more continuous and upfront contact and partying in Hispaniola, which was part of a much greater and immediate trade network and then the spanish stayed for a long time with much more people mm. so right. like the of like the vikings is like what 30 to maybe 150 people what? pop in yeah. there for 20 years and then get the fuck out like the and that the, that disease vector is very small it seems like yeah. and, it, and it looks like you know based on projectile points being embedded in viking skeletons like wasn't very great yeah. Whereas the, the initial interaction in Hispaniola was different. And then the continued interaction in Mesoamerica, which was a hub of trade like that thing. That's when diseases really just kind of spread. Right. Gotcha. Just, yeah. Not to say that there wasn't disease passed along with them, but I just yeah. think that the, the, the effect on the larger community is probably smaller. Or, yeah. should, or it might have happened so long ago, right? Because we're talking about the 11th century that there might have could absolutely have been, but it was much more isolated mm. case. And we just won't see it as compared to what happened in, you know, the late 15th century and 16th century, right? Like that was. And they weren't living in cities as big as Madrid and London and, and Paris, like to be having that much. To, like the Vikings may not have had those diseases on them anyway, being right. isolated yeah. up in Northern Europe. They might have had something because they were in close contact with pigs and cows all the time. Oh yeah, they had, they had something something nasty, huh? That's really interesting. I mean, you wonder, yeah, you wonder what that impact is in the larger scope of things. Like twenty years in an archaeological sense is like nothing, and in human right. interaction sense is real small. Yeah, that's that's a really good like disease vector question of like how do those pathogens spread? You know, I, I think you're right. Like in, in Mesoamerica, it's just there's millions of people. Yeah, um, Tenochtitlan was just done. Yeah. Like there's there's no stopping that. Yeah, um, no, I think the correct word is so orgies. Well, if we want to get into Columbus's diary, that's a little dicey. Yeah, it gets a little hairy. <laughs> Not yeah, Columbus was a fuck. Your first shit. Even yeah. the, the people with Columbus were like, "This guy is sus." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like they were like convicts that came over. Like the like those early conquistadors were just not good people, even by European standards. Like they were just. Did you guys listen to my my episode last week? Nope. Yeah. Uh, I, I kind of didn't. Uh, my friend and I were spitballing this. <laughs> the the con- the conquistadors all came over as entrepreneurs. Like they weren't like soldiers, really. They weren't like they were just businessmen. But also, it's like a known thing that a lot of CEOs and businessmen are sociopaths because yeah. they have that like cutthroat. So like most of those people, if that holds true, coming over to the Americas were just sociopaths let loose with swords and germs, just yeah. destroying North America. Guns, germs, and <laughs> right. And, th- and that, that goes into that whole context. Like Vikings were looking for land. They wanted to be farmers. And like, if you're, it's, if it's going to be difficult to farm, we're going to fuck off. Like that's why they 
like left Newfoundland. It was difficult to farm there. Like there's other mm-hmm. places we can farm that are easier. Whereas like, as David mentioned, the conquistadors stores were there to make money. They were there to for gold. And that was the end goal. And they and wanted land, that goal, yeah. right? That's yeah. the same difference between the relationship with the French and the English and the Spanish and the Americas is like the context in which they're colonizing. The French were like, we're here for natural resources and beavers and we're not staying. <laughs> and so they made like great relationships with the indigenous as trading partners, whereas like the English did the same thing. But once the Americans got all uppity and wanted their own country, then they're like, well, we want the rest of this place as ours. Get rid of everyone else. I think it's and a they of ind- independence. Like, like King George the third is not allowing us to eradicate the Indian savages. Like we want to move West of the Appalachians. Like, I, it's like verbatim in this country's like manifesto, like yeah. bust King George, George the third to fuck off is we want to kill Indians. I did. I saw that too, that like in the early expansive wars with like Tecumseh and stuff, like the British were siding with the indigenous being like, Hey, we told them not to settle past the Appalachians. If you don't want them to do that, Join with us. Yeah. <laughs> it's like the Americans were like, no, we're going to get them. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're going to the end zone being California. Like we're going all the way. hundred yard line. We're getting to the end zone. <laughs> no, like it's like, and yeah, North America history is just fucking crazy. But that was, a, I did like that episode, David. And I know we're totally off topic, but I was like really thinking about how like Pawnee land was under new Spain and then new France and then America while also still being half in Spain for a while right. like, it, it's just, were in Spain and then like yeah it was just like I was like really looking but I was like holy fuck like my ancestral territory has been under the influence of like three major technically four major powers over the course of 500 years yeah dude it's wild and like all those early con- explorers like walked up through to, to like Arkansas from Florida you just don't think about freaking Cabeza de Vaca walking through Nashville, but he like did, <laughs> you know, in full plate armor with malaria. Being and that's like, where I saw. He, that's where he saw the Memphis. Where are the indigenous? <laughs> <laughs> that's where he saw the pyramids in, in Memphis. Donde están los indígenas? <laughs> I can't do a Spanish accent. In the Hennes. In the Hennes. Uh, Anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, I I thought that that stuff was fascinating, but it's the same thing with the, the Viking stuff. Like, you just don't think about that globalism back then you know like just how small the world actually is in a way yeah and i think at the same time in the 11th century that's when polynesians were interacting with south america and yeah. they've gotten to um, rapa nui right and while all this is going on there are inuit in alaska trading with their cousins the inuit in eastern russia and like they have fucking venetian beads in alaska at this part so like people are still connected like there's still way more going on that's just not yeah we forget yeah. it's like North and South America were always connected into this world, but like God forbid just, the Spanish to them at that point it. without thinking about it in terms of cartography. It's like it's just the land that way. It's not like it's a new thing. So when people say like Columbus did discover America, I disagree. I think like for the the most of European culture and like the Enlightenment era like North America was discovered then because that's when people came in droves and they started mapping it out and stuff. Well, I think the idea of like Christopher Columbus didn't discover America because it already been technically discovered for 15,000 years. Like I think it's a juxtaposition of like, yes, Europeans are now made aware of it, but like it was discovered the wrong world. world. Yeah, yeah discovered the wrong world. world. Like it's full like on like annexed. <laughs> like I guess would yeah, be the word. No, no, I mean like um, um brought it, brought uh, like... <laughs> The the world became, of Europeans. Yeah, I think the world became yeah. far more globalized right, at, when Christopher Columbus brought it into the European world. But it was still part of a global cult network that people had been here interacting with their regional partners, which were interacting with their other regional partners. So like, there's stepping zones between North and South America already on a right. broad basis with Europe. So there was already a very long chain of interaction. However, the world became globalized once Europeans... Central Europeans, right? Because we've just established the the Swedes already knew about this place. Southern Europeans, yeah, yeah. yeah so like but, Southern um, Western Europeans are like, oh, now it's part of. But then there's a whole talk about the Basque and the Basque knowing about who cares? Cape Cod, yeah. There's a whole. <laughs> oh my god! There's a whole I, 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 of, like, of of and then like Christopher Columbus' wife is Basque, and these Basque fishermen are coming back with cod. Like there's a whole other like huh, I didn't undercurrent. Know that. Yeah, it's a book called um, Cod. It's called Cod. 
Who wrote but it? I, I want to I want to rephrase that so I don't sound like a white supremacist. But like, <laughs> if you're looking at Newfoundland, it's a little bit past Greenland with a huge cloud behind it. They don't know anything else there. Columbus, what he did was go way to the middle of North America, Central America, and be like, "There's some shit here," and like then it expanded from there. Not to say that he didn't discover it for it, because like he. Or he did discover it first. The other people technically discovered it, but I think that term is just thrown around to be like Columbus bad. And it's I mean, like he, he forged he the was. link. Be- <laughs> yeah, he forged the link between North America, or and and Europe. He created the p- potential for a link between those two. I think that's a better yeah. way of putting it than like saying because discovery is a. Uh, 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 it's a channel. Laden word. Yeah, it's like it's like they now they own it because you discover something. Right? Mm-hmm. Like that's that's not something that. We Let's want. say he was the first to exploit it. I'd buy that. Yeah, I'd buy that. <laughs> I'll take that deal. Yeah, I'll take just, that deal. Yeah, I'll take that deal. That's a good deal. You take that deal, Donnie? That's a good deal. <laughs> I'd make that deal. So just so people know I'm not crazy, it's called it's called Cod, a biography of the fish that changed the world by Mark Kurlansky. And there's a great quote. Cod, it turns out, is the reason Europeans set sail across the Atlantic. And it's the only reason they could. What did the Vikings eat nice in Greenland and on the five expedition to America's recorded in the Icelandic sagas? Cod. Frozen and dried in the frosty air, then broken to pieces and eaten like hardtack. What was the staple of medieval diet? Cod again. Sold, salted by the Basques and enigmatic people with a mysterious, unlimited supply of cod. During the medieval warming period where the European fisheries were absolutely fucking destitute. Where did they get that cod? Evidence points to Cape Cod. Interesting. Yeah, uh, we, we talked about that in cultural <laughs> class. It's a whole fucking thing. Like, there's there's some things behind it. Like, she might have known. Chris has been like, I know something's yeah. over there. They got caught up in it. Um, let's Ooh. end this episode uh, now. We're caught up in it. Caught up in yeah, that was great. Caught, I like that. Caught, caught up in it. Like okay, yeah, yeah. We're uh, before we go on another tangent. Let's end this episode. <laughs> yeah, we're really like twenty two boys. There's a second uh, book called Salt. Guess what that one's about. Salted the cod. <laughs> the salted cod is particularly good. Connor, Connor's going to assault me if I keep this fucking rant going. Um, <laughs> All right. Uh, like, follow, subscribe. Thank you for listening to us. We got links in the show notes to all the the things we referenced during this podcast which was like two things because we are terrible at finding sources but we are not wrong no but this was a fun discussion like i, yeah. I liked from the ones we had i have a bunch of tabs um, like there are a bunch of urls we'll throw them in there. I'll, I'll screenshot my tabs for you <laughs> <laughs> site sources uh guys please be sure to rate and review the podcast uh, where these new formats are kind of fun uh, so just let us know what you're thinking. Comment. I'll try to make a post on Instagram for you guys to comment on. Let us know what you think. Because I know people that follow the Instagram are the ones who do listen. We do have the Discord if you guys want to join that. And yeah, just please be sure to rate and review. And with that, we are out. Um... Thanks for listening to a Life in Ruins podcast. You can follow us on Instagram and Facebook at A Life in Ruins Podcast. And you can also email us at A Life in Ruins Podcast at gmail.com. And remember, make sure to bring your archaeologists in from the cold and feed them beer. Connor, do you have un chiste? Si. Si. Uh, this was sent in by our lovely friend, uh, Jesse Toon. So you guys have already seen this, so act like it's funny. So why do astronauts use Apple products instead of Microsoft products? Because they can't open windows in space. <laughs> Oof. Thank you. And with that, we are out. This episode was produced by Chris Webster from his RV traveling the United States, Tristan Boyle in Scotland. Dig Tech LLC, Cultural Media, and the Archaeology Podcast Network, and was edited by Chris Webster. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com.